Thank you very much. Uh, very good morning to all of you. Uh, first of all, it's a great pleasure to be in this wonderful city of Patiala. Uh, more than anything, um, wonderful hospitality and wonderful set of students. Um, so thanks very much again. Uh, I thought I'll use this, uh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> I thought I'll use this opportunity to give you a, a, a glimpse of the kind of ideas we are pursuing in our laboratory um, in JNU. Uh, yes, I'm from JNU, you can blame me. Um, uh, incidentally, I'm very thankful that the question and answer session is at the end because nowadays if any student uh, lifts his hand, I think he's you know, about to demand azadi or something. Uh, but to come back to, the, uh, to what I'm going to talk to you about, uh, the, the genesis of the thought process, or our thought process, actually began with uh, something that uh, you can say uh, that science and Antakshari have a lot in common, which is Samay Bitane Ke Liye Karna Hai Kuch Kaam. And um, ever since uh, uh, man was able to get a square meal and he looked up at the skies, uh, he incidentally uh, started to ask these two questions, which is uh, where did the universe come from and where did we come from? Incidentally, there is a third question which a lot of scientists have tried, uh, but they still haven't been able to answer this. Which is, melody itni chocolate bhari kaise hai? But to come back to uh, the first question, where did the universe come from? And for a long time, in fact, for perhaps thousands of years, people obviously wondered uh, uh, what, what brought all this about. Uh, but it wasn't until this lawyer, Edwin Hubble, incidentally, so this, this gentleman himself must be a great inspiration for a wonderful place like this. It wasn't until Hubble actually came up with his, uh, uh, his theory and the Hubble constant, which is that the, the universe is expanding through this redshift experiment. And he said, if the universe is expanding, then it must be expanding from somewhere. And of course, hence, it must be expanding from this, this point of uh, space-time singularity. And since then, since the last 100 years or 80 odd years, people have actually uh, more or less uh, strengthened this argument, which is that the universe began with the Big Bang. Uh, but of course, scientists are um, uh, irascible people. Uh, nothing satisfies them. So once this question was more or less sufficiently answered that the universe uh, came into being with the Big Bang, people started asking, well, what was there before the Big Bang? Uh, and uh, a lot of theoretical research has been done by this gentleman called Alexander Vilenkin, where he's actually put forward his theorem called the BGV theorem, which says that something can actually come from nothing, which is that if you have little bit of quantum perturbations, you can have the, the negative um, energy, uh, gravitational field energy totally cancelled out by the positive energy which is there in the form of matter. Um, but these, this is the domain of physicists and I am not a physicist. I am more concerned with the, the second question which is where do we come from? And I must say um, over the last uh, 100, 150 odd years, we have had much more success in answering this question than the first one, than the physicists have had the first one. And we owe a lot to um, uh, a bearded gentleman who actually transformed the world, who is Charles Darwin and his theory of natural selection. She said that the key to survival is, uh, of course, um, adaptability and um, uh, the principle to which each variation, uh, which is actually uh, mutation, is preserved and hence evolution happens. Now, this has uh, this was uh, when he put forward this thing, this was actually called a theory. It is not a theory anymore, it is almost an axiom and it has been shown by a lot of other scientists as well. For example, the famous Stanley Miller experiment that showed that if you were to replicate the early earth atmosphere, how the earth was 4 billion years ago and have electric discharge and water and when he did it, he did it in a reducing atmosphere, but people have replicated his experiment in all sorts of other oxidizing or neutral atmosphere as well. He saw that you uh, what you get at the end are actually small molecules that are harbingers of life and then following that is uh, the seminal work of this 
Nobel laureate Jack Shostak, who's actually, uh, who's proved that even the protocells undergo Darwinian evolution. Protocells are the ones that the earliest cells that were formed without the ability to actually replicate the genetic information inside. And then finally, one of the most, what I consider one of the most important experiments in the last 50 years um, in molecular biology was actually done by uh, this gentleman called Stemmer, William Stemmer. And he actually did what we call directed evolution. That is you chop up bits of DNA and you assemble them again and you accumulate mutations. And what happens is something that was not able to combat stress, um, uh, uh, you know, within half an hour is able to combat million times that stress. And by that stress, I mean antibiotic stress. So this is called directed evolution. And he showed that the key to adaptation is mutation and the key to mutation is diversity. So this is the, the rough background that I, I thought I would uh, mention before we come to the kind of work that we are doing, which is if you look at Rubik's Cube. Now Rubik's Cube has 10 to the power of 19 combinations possible, but of course only one of them is the right answer. Incidentally, I, I don't know about you, but I was very good at uh, solving the Rubik's Cube puzzle. I could do it in about one and a half minutes. Uh, when no one was looking, I would simply peel off the stickers from one face and put them on the other face. Um, but the, the, the thing with proteins is that proteins don't require 10 to the power of 19 different sets to be able to uh, come to a protein that would act drug-like, that would act against a pathogen. So there are about 700 to 800 different fold protein folds possible. So the idea is, uh, the question we asked was, how can we make trillions and trillions of different proteins out of which one could actually act drug-like? And the answer was, why don't we assemble trillions and trillions of different codons, that is the genetic information, that is bits and pieces of DNA that gives rise to the proteins. Uh, so just to give you a glimpse of uh, the amount of uh, diversity that we can generate in a test tube is uh, shown in this slide, that is you have uh, in, in natural uh, cases, if you have, uh, let's say four objects, these are four bases out of which the DNA is made out of A, T, G, and C. So you have uh, four people and you have three base positions. So each codon is made up of three base positions. And what you see is that if any of these four people can sit on these three chairs in any combination possible, the total number of degeneracy is four to the power of three, which is 64. Now, if you want to construct a protein, let's say out of 100 codon positions, 100 chairs, and on each of those chairs, you have 20 naturally occurring amino acids. These, these uh, uh, amino acids can sit on any of these. So 20 people can sit on any of these 100 odd chairs. The degeneracy possible is more than the number of particles there are in the universe that you would generate in a test tube. But of course, it's not that simple because the melting temperature of a double-stranded DNA of a three-base duplex is actually sub-zero. So that is not the temperature at which you would align them like bricks and they would get bigger and bigger and you get DNA fragments out of which you could get more protein. So we thought, why not we actually assemble instead of three base duplex, six base duplex, where the first three bases are actually complement to the next three, uh, with the result that if you put it in a test tube, it actually finds its own uh, and makes a homodimer. And then that is now a, a brick, a proper brick that can then be ligated and then once you have this DNA, you can actually express it to get the protein that you want, all unique proteins. So this set of, we developed this set of 14 DNA duplexes that we call dicodons. And each of these uh, uh, duplexes are actually coding for the naturally occurring amino acids that make up the proteins in our bodies. And the, the procedure for codon shuffling, as we called it, was very simple. You would have a vector which would actually transmit the translation from the DNA to protein and in this vector, in this test tube, you would bung in these 14 dicodons and then put in this glue which is called the DNA ligase which ligates the DNA together and you would get these fragments of varying lengths and then each of these can actually then be amplified to give you huge quantities of these unique DNA fragments that can then be translated to unique DNA proteins, trillions and trillions and trillions of these proteins out of which this protein library one could act drug-like. That, that was the theory. And this is just to, to give you a glimpse of what happens. So these dicodons are now being assembled into these. So this is at the protein level, not at the DNA level. Remember, the DNA is going to be first transcribed into RNA. That's how they, the dogma for life is. And the RNA is then transcribed into, translated into protein. Now here you would get these different chains of proteins that we showed are actually able to fold properly and act drug-like. 
and this was the idea. The basic idea was on one hand, we would have a protein uh, that we want to target and on the other hand, we would have this library of these proteins that we have generated. Somehow we have to make them meet. Now, how did we uh, do that? So, uh, you actually tag the protein library onto this red protein that is shown here and you tag your pathogenic protein, uh, protein from a pathogenic component or, 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 or organism to the blue one and if you have the, uh, the two proteins meeting, then it uh, accelerates the, the transcription or the expression of this gene and you get the, the, the bacterial colony turns from white to blue and that is how you can, so you can see if the two proteins are interacting, then the, the colony would actually come out as blue. If they are not interacting, then the colony would come out as white. So, you would immediately know that one amongst this trillions and trillions of these proteins that you have made is actually acting binding, acting drug like to the, the protein that you want to target. We went ahead and we developed what we called a three hybrid system where you have these set of interacting, naturally interacting proteins. So, you have a blue strain where two proteins are interacting and in this cell, bacterial cell, we introduce this library of trillions and trillions of proteins that would have a different inducer than the one that are inducing the two proteins that are interacting. And what happens is once the sac bursts open, one amongst these trillions of proteins is able to disrupt the protein, known protein-protein interaction, thereby it is actually targeting a known pathogenic known protein-protein interaction. And this you can see very clearly out here, you have an interacting, two interacting proteins and the moment this sac bursts open by giving uh, l arabinose which is a different inducer, you can see that the, the blue color actually slowly changes to white. And what we did was we targeted this, this uh, very important protein, host protein. Uh, which is called the ICAM. ICAM is intercellular addition molecule and is one of the most important molecules uh, and this is expressed on the surface of the human cell and it helps the host, host cells to actually adhere to other cells and it plays a very important role also uh, through the, uh, the symbiosis of pathogens that have actually lived amongst us for millions of years. They have actually begun to use this molecule for their own benefit. And Mycobacterium tuberculosis as well as Plasmodium falciparum actually use this protein for their own benefit to establish the infection. So, we thought rather than targeting Plasmodium falciparum or malaria or tuberculosis and the proteins therein, why not we target the host proteins that actually help these pathogens. The idea being that if you target a pathogenic protein, uh, within 5 or 10 years, bacteria are, uh, bacteria are very clever, uh, 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 you know, things, they are much more clever than us. They actually develop resistance against the antibiotics that is uh, targeting a bacterial protein. And we know that there are strains right now called TDR, totally drug resistant tuberculosis, where the strain is drug resistant to the first 12 frontline antibiotics against tuberculosis. So, this is a really scary scenario and that is the case with malaria as well. There are uh, chloroquine resistant strains, there are even artemisinin resistant strains. So, we decided why not we target a human protein because then the bacteria or the malaria parasite will not be able to develop resistance because we are not targeting the malaria, we are targeting the protein that is helping malaria or mycobacterium tuberculosis and this is exactly what we did and this was one of the proteins from the, the library that we have and it is you can see out here in the slide, I do not know whether it is very clear or not that if you actually have this M5 protein, the malaria parasite is not able to invade the red blood cell. But if you do not have this protein, the binder inhibitor that we have M5, then it is able to get inside the cell. And we, and we were able to show that across resistant strains of both mycobacterium tuberculosis as well as uh, plasmodium falciparum which is a parasite, uh, it inhibits the, our protein inhibits the invasion by as much as 85 to 90 percent. Now, once we had actually done this and we proceeded further to investigate more what kind of other ICAM, it is a family of proteins ICAM 4, ICAM 3, ICAM 5 are involved in helping the pathogens. We also decided to actually move a little bit further and find out what are the receptors, host receptors on the red blood cells that are helping malaria uh, parasite gain infection. And here you can see in this very short film that this is, these are the red blood cells and you have the parasite which is shown in, in yellow here and the parasite then slowly tethers on to the red blood cell and once it tethers on there are these mechanisms that recognize this, the parasite recognizes these receptors and it actually invades, it gets in and once it gets in, it actually leaves out the sheath of proteins that has helped 
it invade into the red blood cell and now the red blood cell is infected and the infected red blood cell actually moves much slower than the normal red blood cells in the stream and there is something that called the process of cytoadherence that is it starts to adhere to the, the cell, uh, the, uh, the vessel walls and slowly inside the parasite multiplies and once it multiplies after the enough multiplications are done it actually bursts open the red blood cell and the cell of course is dead but you have these hundreds or dozens of these parasites now ready to invade other uh, red blood cells as well. And here we found a mechanism, very strange mechanism where the parasite were using two proteins and they were tethering on like a lock and key. They were actually binding to two host proteins that are cyclophilin B and the other protein was um, uh, basogen. Uh, and the corresponding malaria proteins were RAPH3 and RH5. And you can clearly see in this slide that we were able to, once we developed inhibitors against these uh, host proteins, we were able to inhibit the invasion of malaria again by 75 to 80 percent. And we are taking this, th this thing forward because as it turns out, we have a lot of common host proteins, host proteins that have been developed over millions and millions of years that all these dangerous parasites and bugs have actually started to use. In fact, uh, there have been a lot of studies done and people have found out there are as many as 200 to 300 human proteins that are essential for even HIV or the AIDS virus to actually gain infection. Likewise for dengue, for malaria, for tuberculosis. So when we say that we are absolutely isolated from these pathogens is actually not true. We have survived along with them for millions and millions of years. So hopefully um, I have given you a glimpse of how but just by looking at Rubik's cube uh, and looking at the total number of permutations possible we can try and generate within test tube a library of these drug like proteins and one amongst them is truly able to actually help uh, 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 deny invasion to these bacterial pathogens. Thank you very much.